Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today, once again, for a second time, by Elliot Abrams, who's had a distinguished career in government at both the State Department and the White House, and has written important books when you weren't in government. But I thought we could talk today about the next administration, the challenges they face in foreign policy, which you're almost sure. uniquely qualified to discuss. And maybe first, uh, about how they're going to put themselves together to conduct a foreign policy. You've been through this. I think you you came into the Reagan administration in 1981, right at the beginning. Yes. And then the Bush administration very close to the beginning in, <clears throat> in 2001. Yeah. So you've really seen this transition. And this year, whether Hillary Clinton wins or Donald Trump wins, uh, we'll have a pretty thoroughgoing transition, right? You know, this ought to be a better transition in one way. After 2000, we changed the law so that the transition is supposed to begin when you're nominated, not when you're elected. So you get that extra um, month, anyway, of September, October, two months. Right. Ten weeks, close to. Um, so you have more time. Uh, I'm not involved in the transitions this year, so I'm not sure what's going on. The critical thing is probably personnel. It's the drawing up of lists of candidates for, you know, it's thousands of positions. Um, and particularly if you're in the Trump transition, I would think this is a difficult task, actually. You're new. You've never done this before. Some of the people working for you have never really done this before because, frankly, because so many uh, Republican veterans have checked out, you know, have right. signed letters saying we're not going to support Trump, and therefore, obviously, they're not involved. So what, I mean, let's say either one wins and calls you in as a veteran, uh, this is not really political advice or even substantive right. advice, it's sort of how do we have a competent team functioning on January 20th when we take over? What do you tell President Clinton or President Trump? What's your sort of, uh, for the next two and a half months, how do they get it, uh, can they get a competent team together even that fast? Could you have a new administration on January, I mean, well, uh, I mean you'll have a team, yeah, I mean, could, you will you know, how, how understaffed will they be on January 21st? They will be understaffed. Uh, the top positions are filled. You know, the Senate always, as a matter of courtesy, uh, confirms Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. White House staff, of course, does not need confirmation. So if you have found your people, they can start uh, coming in. The problem is that, so you're elected, okay? It takes a while for people to make decisions. You have to kind of trickle down here. That is, people want to hire their own number two, number three, number four. Uh, the Secretary, you can't hire Assistant Secretaries of State um, until you have a Secretary of State. Your first choice may say no. Your second choice may say no. For people who have to get confirmed, you know, uh, April is considered uh, a speedy confirmation. Oh. Uh, it starts after January 20th. So you really don't have everybody in place throughout the bureaucracy, uh, uh, really until the summer. Even the White House staff does not get fully filled up, I would say, um, for a few months. My advice to the, uh, to the president-elect, I, I imagine Secretary Clinton knows this, but um, would be to worry a lot about the White House staff. Yeah, I'm curious about this, since you served in both the State Department and the White House. So, yeah. so I was thinking, if they call, ask, okay, what should I do really first? I mean, I, uh, you got to have a Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, right. obviously. But um, the old line, where you stand depends on where you sit, is right. Meaning, um, your cabinet members, uh, are your key assistants, and they are your natural enemies. <laughs> and the minute they sit down in their departments, they will take on a different coloration. It's not that they're disloyal. It's not that they're hostile. But, you know, some of them want to have careers after you're gone. They're the younger ones. Or they want to go out and make money after you're gone. Um, they have a building to manage, which means they're concerned about the morale in their building. They, they want people in their building and in the relevant groups outside the building, whether it's business or foreign governments, whatever it is. Um, it's very different. I mean, it, think of Condi Rice, National Security Advisor, then Secretary of State. When you're National Security Advisor, you're in the White House. The first thing you do in the morning, you have, you go to the staff meeting of all the other people who work directly for the president. When you're Secretary of State, you're in a different building. You see the president sometimes. You travel a lot. Your constituents are, in a way, other foreign ministers. And the staff meeting you have in the morning is of your assistant secretaries of state. Uh, so and, it's, and you're looking down to your building, yep. not yep. worrying first and foremost about and, the president. Right. I, I mean, one piece of advice I would give them about the White House staff is um, 
don't allow holdovers. I mean, I know everybody thinks continuity, but uh, you want people who are loyal to you, just to you. So I'd worry about holdovers, and I'd worry about people coming out of the bureaucracy, too. Um, at least at the um, senior level, say for the NSC, we're talking about the number one and two and three people, but, but also the senior directors that's who have um, d divisions, departments of the NSC like Asia, Latin America, Middle East, narcotics. Don't take people out of the bureaucracy. Don't take people who were seconded from state, DOD, CIA. Take loyalists who believe in you, who believe in what you're saying, because there's a gigantic bureaucracy out there. And particularly for Donald Trump, they didn't vote for you. Um, so how do you control that bureaucracy? How do you get them to do what you want? How do you even know what they're doing? White House staff is critical. I would also say when it comes to the assistant secretaries, there are different theories here. I mean, Condi Rice's theory was you take the best people from the Foreign Service. George Shultz's theory when he was Secretary of State for Reagan was you don't take career Foreign Service officers. You take political appointees who are Republicans who are going to be loyal to the president. Uh, I think that's a better model, and that's the model that I would advise for both of them. Take, take political appointees who you think will be loyal to you and your views. I know it sounds like a bad rap on the bureaucracy, but I think it makes the government work better. Yeah, and say a word more about why, I mean, I think for outsiders, it's not really how business is. I mean, everyone, for CEO, brings in his one or two favorites and all that. But I'd say normal people listening to this might think, gee, shouldn't, you know, competence and qualifications count more than loyalty? That seems like an awfully inside kind of, you know, personalizing way of thinking of it. But why is loyalty so important to these jobs, especially at the White House staff? And what are they, what is it? guard against? What does it accomplish? It's good to think there are normal people listening to yeah, this, yeah, well, watching this. <laughs> um, I remember, I, was, I came to Washington a little after you, and I came in 85, and I was at first bewildered by, by this little bit. I, I kind of slightly rebelled. I remember I worked for Bill Bennett, and, he, you know, this guy's good. He's, he was with us at any, Bill's previous job at NEH. I think he'll be good. I said, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there are better people out in the country who know this is education department, who know more about education policy. Shouldn't we get them? And it took me a while to realize this wasn't just my boss, you know, the cabinet secretary being clannish or just liking people who liked him, that he had a, there was a rash, there's a reason why you want loyalists, but I think it's worth explaining. I mean, yeah, I think there are two things critical here. You need to get the job done. So you need people who can actually do it and can work effectively in a bureaucracy. We're talking about a bureaucracy here, a huge, vast bureaucracy. Um, you can be highly intelligent. You can be, for example, maybe a fantastically a brilliant academic, but unable to function in government. So that's one thing you need to do. You need to get people who um, who can. Now, some people come out of the academy, Henry Kissinger, who can instantly master the bureaucracy, but some people can't. Some people from business can't. Uh, George Schultz, when he became Secretary of State, hired a dear friend who is a really successful businessman as Under Secretary of State for Management, and he quit after three weeks and said to Schultz, government is hopeless. Nothing happens here, I'm out. So that's first, getting people who can function in the government setting. But the loyalty question is critical because the president's team is actually quite small. If you think of um, roughly 10,000 people at the State Department, what, a million? In the Defense Department, many, many, in the tens of thousands in CIA, and then there's the domestic department. Your White House staff is a few hundred people. I mean, okay, the NSC, I think, under um, Bush was two, roughly 200. It's now more than doubled. Um, and that's too big. But you have, let's say, 1,000 people. But the bureaucracy is, is millions of people. The president issues an instruction or guidance. Uh, it goes over to HUD. It goes over to HHS. It goes over to DOD. It can be ignored. Uh, it can be uh, given uh, lip service. Um, what's the follow-up? How do you know if maybe they're trying and failing? Maybe they're trying in good faith, but it isn't working. How do you know? Well, they'll tell you, but they'll tell you what they want you to hear. 
uh, how do you dig down a level deeper? I think that in every administration, there's an organization chart. I mean, you can look it up uh, online. It's in textbooks. The secretary, the assistant secretary, the deputy. That exists, and it's important. But I think every administration has a kind of nervous system of loyalists that are in each department that you know you can reach out to. Sometimes you know people know each other from the campaign. Other times they get to know each other where you know they really want to do what the president wants to do. Uh, and that, that the government can't function unless that nervous system is also working. Mm -hmm. It does seem to be, just to kind of wrap up this section, I mean, it's an asymmetric situation. Right? Was, Hillary Clinton knows she's been in the White House, she's been in the State Department, she probably knows who she wants at this point and, and probably thinks she knows at least how to make the system work. And um, Trump really would be the most outsider-ish person to come in in modern times, maybe ever. And maybe Reagan is, though, the closest comparison. He'd never worked in Washington. He had presumably, especially, hadn't done foreign policy as governor of California and was an outsider in his own party to some degree, not, mm -hmm. not in a Trumpy way. And you were there at the Reagan. I think you were part of the transition team yeah. and then became assistant secretary of state yes. once you got confirmed pretty quickly, right? So, yes. So what, I mean, uh, particular for Trump, I guess it's sort of, a, you can say loyalist, but how many foreign policy lo loyalists does he have? He has no, you know, there's no, right. then there's a tidy team, uh, I suppose, helping run the campaign. But uh, it's an interesting question if Trump he, calls you in. What do you, how does he? You need a few people, uh, and they may not exist, but um, whom you trust, um, who know Washington. Now, Reagan, for example, I remember after we won, um, I was on the transition team, but, but I wanted a job. So who did I talk to? Two you people. were on the State Department transition team? I was, actually, AID transition team, um, with Ed Fulner, the longtime president of, and then president of the Heritage Foundation. Um, I went to talk to Bill Casey, who had been campaign manager, and Bill Timmons, a uh, famous Washington lobbyist of that uh, period who had been one of the campaign's top people. Um, Reagan was using them after the campaign was over uh, to help with a variety of political and personnel tasks. Uh, and that was smart because they had been around Washington, uh, Timmons permanently, Casey obviously in and out. Um, but they knew how these things worked. And uh, he will need, Trump uh, would need to find people like that. Maybe Gingrich is one for him. Um, you do find people whom you trust. It can take a year, though. And so the, if you think of the first year of the Reagan administration, um, he hires Alexander Haig, but a year and a half later, Haig is out. And really after the first, I don't know, six or nine months, White House State Department relations were terrible. So that can happen. Uh, and you have to be able and willing to correct mistakes, I guess, the way Trump does on TV. You're fired. Right, right. Um, but I think he he's going to have a problem because I'm not sure that most of the people we think of as his loyalists have ever had this experience of putting an administration together or even working in an administration and really know how to um, how to do it. Yeah, I suppose Gingrich. I mean, Christie and Giuliani, at least at the state and local level, have put together governments, and so it's Washington's a little different. So. But he'll find people, I suppose. It is. Yeah, if he wins. Everyone will people. suddenly decide they're happy to help. <laughs> and, and they should probably. So be president of the United States, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that's right. I mean, that is, I think a lot of people um, won't or have already, in a sense, from Trump's point of view, cast themselves out. Yeah. And it is probably true that he ought to say, let's let bygones be bygones and we'll forget about all those letters that said I'm the worst person on earth. Um, most politicians don't work that way. And Trump doesn't seem to have to be, right. to be erring on the side of forgiving and, and so right. forth. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Well, let's just, okay, that's very interesting. So let's assume they get this administration together, or the beginnings of it together. But let's assume then the next president calls you in. They've got the secretaries of state and defense and the national security advisor and the key deputies there appointed. And now he or she wants a private discussion of, like, what about the war? Okay, so what is the situation in the world? What, what do I... What do I need to know? What should I focus on? What what that isn't in the headlines really is important? What can I sort of ignore that everyone else is telling me I have to? What, what do you say on January 19th to either? Uh, You've got two separate issues here, though. Obviously, they come together. One of them is uh, the set of problems that we need to face, you know, North Korea, Syria. Right. Where do you need to make decisions? That's a critical thing that has to be done during the transition. Is there anything you need to make a decision on 
on January 20th or in January or in February? What are the things that, can, that are going to come and hit you? So there are, there are the issues. But the separate um, set of things that I would say is, look, after eight years of Obama, the American position in the world is uh, not good. Neither our enemies nor our allies um, feel that we are a rising power. And uh, our allies do not feel they can rely on us. They don't know where the United States is now. Uh, if you are facing Iran, um, Saudis, Emiratis, Jordanians, Israelis, if you are facing Russia, Poles, Czechs, Estonians, if you are facing China, Australians, Japanese, South Koreans, Taiwanese, you don't really know. Um, so <clears throat> you need to do something, real or symbolic, that begins to reassure them that the period of drift under Obama is over. A part of this may be uh, working with Congress on the military budget. I think that would be quite reassuring, although you know, in one day it doesn't change anything. It shows a trend. I think it's worthwhile looking for uh, more dramatic ways to show that America is back. Uh, Reagan did it oddly, you know, with firing the air traffic controllers, which right. had nothing to do with foreign policy, but it was a demonstration of willpower. There are things one could do. Um, the two that would top my list on foreign policy would be uh, the Persian Gulf and Syria. I think we need to have a different reaction under a new president the next time uh, a, naval, a ship is swarmed by a bunch of uh, Iranian gunboats that pull up within a few hundred yards in a very dangerous fashion. Um, and I think that if we sank one of those gunboats, it would be a shot heard around the world. I think in Tehran, of course, but in Beijing and in Moscow and in all the allied capitals, people would say, whoa, they're back. And it, no, it does not lead to World War III. Um, and in Syria, I think, and, and this is something that the president would have to get to in the first month, um, the, our Syria policy, in my opinion, has been to do nothing that makes Iran angry. Um, and so we have no Syria policy. And we send Kerry, or he goes uh, on his own, to Geneva, uh, and, and it makes us look weak and foolish. Uh, do you want to do anything about Syria? Do you want... Are you prepared? You're the new president. Prepared to see Assad use chemical weapons on your watch. Are you prepared to see these bunker busters hitting more hospitals and killing more civilians on your watch and looking as feckless as Obama over this? And if not, what are the options, military options, if any, um, that you have? And then, uh, so I think there's that overall picture of reassurance of allies, deterrence of uh, enemies, opponents. And you think that's a, uh, one would have that conversation with Hillary Clinton, who was President Obama's Secretary of State, and is from the same party, almost as much or in a similar way, maybe you'd frame it a little differently, but you think it's actually as important advice for her as it is for Trump. I mean, that, that she needs to think of herself as a fresh start, not as somehow bound to continue. And does she, do you think it's something that would be it's hard if you're from the same party, right, to make that quick a turn, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, you know, it depends what's really, um, what's her thinking. But, right. um, and maybe this is the wish being father to the thought for me, but look, Syria. Petraeus, Panetta, and Clinton in 2012 actually urged Obama right. to take a, um, a harder line. You know, when she was a senator, she was on the Armed Services Committee. She has some knowledge, I would assume, of the uh, declining American uh, military power. People can uh, suppose, for example, that for the sake of continuity, she decides to keep on Ash Carter as Secretary of Defense for one year. Not impossible. Uh, I mean, uh, Obama did it. He kept on Bob Gates. Gates. Uh, I think the advice she will be getting from DOD, from him, uh, civilian appointee, but from the uniformed military is, hey, things are bad and there are options. And here they are, and Obama <laughs> rejected all of them. But, uh, you know, Bush, the last time this happened, if it is going to be Clinton, um, was, of course, George H.W. Bush following Ronald Reagan. Well, he didn't, you know, it, it, it didn't go day, night, night, day, but, but he certainly changed the policy. He certainly changed the whole look of American foreign policy, I think, in an unfortunate way in, in, in some cases. But uh, the fact that it's the same party... Yeah. In a way, I think if you're Hillary Clinton, 
you you very much want to differentiate yourself from Obama because you're you. You do not want to be seen as, seen as Obama's third term. And you think as a analytical matter, I'm leaving aside in some respects all the criticisms you've made and I've made of Obama over the years, I mean, it really would be important for the next president to act pretty quickly in terms of the allies and enemies because the dynamic, I guess, if he, if he or she didn't, would be if you're sitting in Japan or Saudi or anywhere or in Iran, you sort of think, okay, I guess it's more of the same. We, the Obama wasn't very strong, and, and this next person, Trump, well, I was going to say Trump with the rhetoric notwithstanding, though, in a way Trump's rhetoric is on both sides of this since he's yep. sort of an isolationist. Hillary Clinton, the fact that she was Obama's Secretary of State notwithstanding, it's sort of more of the same. So your main advice, it sounds like, would be in a way – it, it can't look like more of the same. That really, as a policy matter, you do not want foreign capitals to think Obama was four more years of in the same direction. I think that's path. critical, and I think that, that if it doesn't happen, then let's say after a period of months, of the summer perhaps, um, you will have people changing their policies to reflect what they expect to be uh, four more years of what I would call weakness or drift. And, you know, if you're the Saudis and you're looking at Iraq or Yemen or if you're in East Asia worrying about what we do to hold back China or worrying about Putin, you're going to change your policy. What makes you a bit hopeful about this is the new president is going to sit down uh, over a relatively brief period, I would think, with the leaders of some of these countries. And, you know, if you visit these countries... Uh, this is what they think. They're yeah, very talk about worried that a about I mean, You were in Asia recently, and of course, Middle East, you're an expert. And you yeah, a lot, I mean, so. in July and September, I... I um, but you were in Japan, which you hadn't uh, been in India or something. Right, like uh, yeah. and I talk to people as they come through Washington, and what's remarkable is that if you talk to people from, <laughs> you know, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Israel, Saudi Arabia, I mean, you hear the same line, basically, which is... Uh, I mean, they don't say this, but where are you guys? What's happening? Um, they're very worried about um, whether, in fact, this is isolationism. Um, is the United States saying a version, actually, of, of Trump's statements about NATO? We're carrying too big a burden, and we're not going to do it anymore. So you're on your own. Uh, they're very much worried about this. And they see a, a, a decay of the American dash Western position over the last few years, rising China, rising Russia, rising Iran. He's going to, he or she is going to hear that politely put. And I think that pushes obviously in the right direction. And I suppose for our allies, having the Republican candidate in particular seem the more be the more isolationist. Is must be a little bit jarring because I think they've always thought you know Democrats maybe reacted against Bush and whatever Obama, but the Republican Party is actually pretty strong. And then the Republican candidate is, is criticizing NATO and more anti the Iraq War than Hillary Clinton and so forth. I mean, that must have them a little. Yeah, do you I, get this? Get, I'm just curious. Does this get raised a lot when you meet with foreign ambassadors? Foreign. It gets raised, and and the lack of understanding of of Trump <clears throat> gets raised a lot. I mean, if you think of the last, not only presidents, but defeated candidates for president. Right. Pretty, you know, people they knew. Right. Uh, John Kerry, John McCain, you know, Al Gore. I mean, these were familiar figures to uh, most foreigners. Reagan, an exception. Um, so the questions are, you know, there's a question or two about uh, Clinton. And do you think so-and-so will be Secretary of State or will be so-and-so? With Trump, it's a kind of, um, we don't know him. Do you know anybody we could talk to? Um, who might be secretary of this or that? They're just lost. And these are very hard questions to answer because he has not put forward, uh, you know, a 30-page position paper, and he doesn't have a long track record of, you know, of going to these various meetings that people go to in Aspen or in right. Sedona or in all these places and uh, uh, going to the, the security conferences in Europe and giving long speeches on these questions. So they're nervous. And on the trade issue in particular, I was, we we're, were speaking just for the same week of the first presidential debate and where Donald Trump was attacking what had been bipartisan positions, really. Yeah. I think I was thinking about this. Both presidential candidates of both parties, to my knowledge, have always supported NAFTA. 
I think Gore, yeah, Gore must have, yep. of course, he yep. did, and then and yep. Kerry, and, and certainly the Republicans did, and for that, and other trade agreements, yep. and the TPP, the Asian agreement, has had, I believe, uh, Obama certainly supports it, and negotiated it, and Bush certainly supported it when he was president, and I believe McCain and Romney supported yep. it when they were challengers. So it must be a little unnerving for them to suddenly see both candidates, well, one candidate just attacking NAFTA is the yep. worst thing that ever happened, and Hillary Clinton being fairly quiet about <clears throat> this, what, what was a pretty big accomplishment of her husband's administration, and then on the Asian agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, both of them saying no. I wonder how much that's got them under, I mean, how much damage has to be undone just from that? I mean, It's a good question. I, I think um, they're hopeful that Hillary is lying. <laughs> right. I mean, they're hopeful that this is campaign rhetoric and it'll be fixed if she's president, but I, I would say that they, in my conversations, people don't, they're less concerned with the trade treaties narrowly defined as, gee, we really wanted provision five, right, right. and more concerned about what it means about American politics. Uh, is the United States in some deep way, are the American people in a way that's going to be reflected in Congress as well, um, changing our minds about the role we have played since World War II. Are we really saying we're tired of it and we're not going to do that anymore and take care of yourselves? That, that I think, is the much deeper worry than, th that is to say, the trade agreements are, are seen as the product right. of, of this deep, or potentially the product of this deeper question they have. So it sounds like, actually, the advice to the new president would be pretty deep or thoroughgoing in the sense that you don't just have to Reassure, you know, deal with this particular problem here or change this, I don't know, whatever policy, you know, tweak it there on Israel-Palestine or a million things, North Korea. But you really need to send a major message really around the world. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose at home too, right? Because in a way you have yeah. to send a message <clears throat> to the American people. Uh, you know, and, to uh, and in, in, an, in a way it's harder, uh, the best comparison is probably Reagan, and it's harder than it was for Reagan because yeah, let's talk that was that. the message of Reagan's campaign. Right. I mean, Reagan said it a thousand times. Therefore, it was to be assumed that, okay, now he's won and he will do this. But neither candidate... Well, is, just on the 1980 yeah. comparison, and Jimmy Carter, for you and I weren't big fans of his administration, <laughs> but um, and I'm not even a retrospect, but he did pivot in 1980 after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the right. Iranian hostage crisis, increased defense spending, said he it was a new moment. And so I, it probably was even, I'm sure they, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of criticism he made of Carter and, and the damage that was done under his watch. But you could also say the Democratic Party was coming back from uh, sort of it was. Yeah, uh, at least he was. And presumably right. as president, he could have brought the party with him. Right. But the message of Reagan's victory was right. precisely, yeah, even bigger. this yeah. is a turn. Yeah. Neither candidate this year is Well, that's a very important point. That. So you're saying that, yeah, so what you're saying really is what the world needs to hear is that we're, we're going to have a major turn back to American leadership, and we're having a campaign which neither candidate is saying that. Right, right. They're saying, uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I get it. Uh, we don't want to spend all this money, and we don't want to be on the hook, and we don't want to send 100,000 troops anywhere. So um, it would require saying or doing some things um, early on. Inaugural address is important. Um, uh, first meetings with members of Congress uh, and doing something that would suggest, I mean, even if you, you know, if your inaugural address says, look, um, sequestration has been terrible and there is a bipartisan agreement now that the defense budget needs to start rising. We need to rebuild, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's a big deal. It's just words, but it's a very, uh, I think very, it would be significant to say that in the inaugural address, and really significant not to say it. Yeah, and, and if the inaugural address is a lot of stuff about how people are hurting at home and we have to really spend, you know, that's got to be our focus and very little about the world, I suppose. Nation building at home, or as George McGovern said, come home, America. Right. Uh, I think it'd be devastating. So that's very interesting. So that's really a big picture challenge to the new president, which whether it's Trump or Clinton, Yep. for a pretty big pivot in American foreign policy. Uh, it is. It, and important that it happened pretty quickly. Or you, you I think, think so. I mean, you can't go six. So I'm thinking about everything for six months, so we'll get back to you in the summer. That's not really. Right. And you, you don't have to. I mean, you can say this um, and then say, you know, now uh, this affects all of our key allies all over the world with whom we're going to be consulting. As a matter of fact, 
uh, my new Secretary of State X, sets out on Monday and will visit the following 10 capitals, and the Secretary of Defense will visit these others. So you can, in a sense, delay uh, doing anything, and consulting will sound great uh, also. So you don't have to make all these decisions on January 20th. And, you know, January 20th, you have a lot of parades. You don't make any decisions. But um, I think you have to show something very quickly, or people will, again, start hedging additional bets. So let's assume this new president open to your advice to generally project U.S. strength, power, leadership. So, okay, now let's get a little more granular, a little more talk about regions of the world, particular okay. problems, challenges, crises. I mean, I've got to probably begin somewhere. I, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but what would you suggest? Looking around the world, um, you've had responsibilities in government all over the world, and some of your secretaryships were you know, not regional. They were for, you know, human rights or whatever, for the international organization, right, for the whole. What, what? What comes to mind? I mean, given the unpredictability, of yeah. things, as a sort of it um, sounds like Syria from what you said earlier, it's yeah, and Iran. It sounds like I mean, it, uh, Syria, Iran, let's say Middle East is one thing. North Korea uh, would be another. Uh, on um, uh, the Middle East, look, uh, Iran is constantly challenging us um, in the Persian Gulf, not indirectly, not through proxies, not us capturing sailors in January last, uh, surrounding American ships uh, all over the time, and, and more this past summer. The pace actually grew. Um, I think you want to do something about that, and you want to begin by uh, telling them through some channel, Oman, Russia, um, it's over, guys. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then, of course, if you say that, you have to be ready to act. Uh, Syria is an incredibly difficult uh, problem now. It didn't have to be, in my opinion, uh, in Hillary Clinton's opinion. Right. She advised a different policy in 2012. Um, I think we need um, first to increase our aid to the non-jihadi Syrian opposition. If we don't, uh, first of all, they'll come closer to defeat, but what will they do? I mean, some of them will join al-Qaeda-linked or IS-linked uh, groups. Um, the new president, if we haven't taken Mosul, the new president's going to be faced with the decision of what to do about Mosul, uh, which is going to produce, by U.S. government estimates, something like 700,000 refugees. Where are they going to go? How are they going to be fed? What happens to the fighters in Mosul? Do they go reinforce Raqqa? Um, and if Mosul has been taken, um, we're going to deal with the aftermath of that, uh, our Shia uh, troops killing Sunni civilians. Uh, if we haven't taken Raqqa, then that's a big decision you're going to face. How do we do that? Who does? And we say we. Who on the ground? If it's the Kurds, you're going to have a problem with Turkey. Um, if it's Shia militia you're going to, from Iran, you're going to have the Shia-Sunni problem. So that, that, that's a um, a major problem. I would say two things. The first, additional aid for the non-jihadi uh, rebels, and they exist, and unlike, I mean, the President uh, Obama famously called them a bunch of worthless pharmacists. Um, they're not, and they're still fighting, and it's been four years, and they're still fighting. Secondly, I think we need to confront, the new president needs to confront uh, Assad's continuing use of chemical weapons. Chlorine, that's the poison gas that was outlawed in World War I. Um, and the barrel bombs on hospitals, uh, what was done in Aleppo in September. Um, just savage. Um, what do you want to do about that? Do you want to do anything about that? Do you want to tell him to stop it? We have the ability to say stop it and to make him stop it by taking out his Air Force. Um, bold? Yes. But again, it's not World War III, and it doesn't require troops on the ground to do that. That's, that's uh, Air Force or cruise missiles. So, so it sounds as if, yes, the Syria, Iran, Iraq, Nexus, fall that the next president probably thinks, oh, I don't want to think about those countries. It's a mess. It's difficult. We intervened. It was difficult. We got out. Right. Caused problems. It's very hard to signal American strength while doing nothing there, while the slaughter right. continues in right. Syria, while Iran <clears throat> continues to look dominant, especially after the Iran deal was such a signature of Obama. I mean, Yeah, and especially after um, our kind of pathetic performance with the Russians where right. – Kerry negotiates deals, the Russians uh, break them, you have a ceasefire, you don't have a ceasefire, we look like beggars, actually. Um, 
That's got to change. And uh, the question really is, does the president recognize, I think Obama and Kerry don't, that diplomacy is not chatter. Um, it's a way of, of um, using national power, just as economic clout is, military clout is, and they've got to go together. And if it's clear that the president never wants to do anything in Syria, you can send Kerry a thousand times to Geneva, he'll never get anything serious, because right. why would the Russians give an inch? Right. So you've got to face that, and that's early. I mean, that's January, February. North Korea is not your first day in office, but you're going to be there for four years, presumably. And they are, uh, maybe on your watch, they're going to have the capability of hitting the continental United States with a nuclear weapon. Is that acceptable to you? If it isn't acceptable to you, what are you going to do about it? Um, again, it, these are hard problems or they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't exist now. Um, you're going to need to face the question of whether there's something you can do to get the Chinese to take it more seriously. You know, we've had basically the same policy under um, um, <laughs> really Bush, Clinton, right. Bush, Obama, and of course it's failed and they get closer and closer to a, a weapon and delivery system that can hit us. Are, is there a way of making the Chinese take it more seriously? And here's the example I'd give. What if we uh, persuade the Chinese, that, you know, um, sooner or later the Japanese and the South Koreans are gonna really start thinking about nuclear weapons. We don't want that. You don't want that. So what are, you, what are you prepared to do about it? If they take it seriously, I think they would act differently. Maybe not worth thinking through. Okay. But, but North Korea, um, major problem. Can you get president? That's an interesting way you put it. The, it'll happen on your watch or in your four years. I guess, I guess presidents, when they're newly sworn in, do have something like that perspective, right? I mean, in your experience, that they think that way in a way. I mean, they, they, they don't just do day to day, week to week. Presumably there's a minute there before they get swamped by the office where they, you can sort of raise an issue and say, if you don't change course now, you're looking at a horrible situation. Uh, yeah, I actually think presidents are better at this than their staffs are. Hmm. Um, you know, there was a, uh, James Callahan, who was a prime minister of England at one point, had been minister of this, minister of that, and somebody once said to him, I guess being prime minister is much harder. And he said, no, 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 no. When you're a minister, you have a department, thousands and tens of thousands of people work for you. Uh, the workflow overwhelms you every day. When you're prime minister, you don't actually have to do anything. Uh, you get to choose. There's some truth to that for the president, too. Um, in a way, it's overwhelming, but on the other hand, you know, your schedule's your own. Staff people, I think, tend to be swallowed by the incoming, what used to be paper, it's now emails, and worried about what's going to happen at 3 p.m. Right. Presidents, I think, generally are better at stepping back and saying, hey, you know, I'm president, that, that's Lincoln, and that's uh, Washington on the wall. Um, where do I fit, and what are people going to say about me 100 years from now? Uh, so I think you've got, uh, th I think that really goes with the job. And as, as you know, if you think back to our presidents uh, last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, I think they all felt that. So you can appeal to that. Um, and it's useful if the staff is not just sort of saying, we need to squeeze in uh, this guy at 3.30, um, but is occasionally saying, where are we? Where are we in the world? Where are you? What, what, how does it all look? How's it all going? Um, sense of perspective. Uh, I, uh, the president, in a sense, and you know, to some extent, it, it, it can be also, can be. The president's family or the president's spouse can sometimes help with this. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, you've, and President Bush, the one you, who you, like, of the different presidents, the one you presumably you must have spent the most time with, he had some capacity. I think he tried. He had a very good this. capacity for this, and he thought about it a lot. Uh, okay, partly because his father had been president, so uh, yeah. he had thought about this in terms of his own father. But he thought about this a lot. I think it's um, uh, religious faith matters here too, because it gives you a sense of, of, of um, perspective on yourself as a person and on the job you're doing. So uh, I think Bush, um, it, you don't want it, you know. You don't want to be paralyzed by it. You don't want to start saying, well, I can't do that. My legacy would be, right. you know. But, but I think it's useful to step back in a way that 
uh, most of the people working for you are not going to be able to do. And to think about, not to think about um, how many campaign promises can I keep and which ones do I have to break, but rather to think you definitely have four years. I mean, God willing, you have four years. Right. Um, where do you want to be in four years? Yeah. Which are the problems you think you can solve or significantly ameliorate? And obviously, we're not uh, talking about the domestic uh, right. questions. I, I should add one thing here, which is um, you're going to have to deal with Congress on a lot of this. And uh, Obama's way of handling all of this was to, I think, deal contemptuously with Congress and to use executive orders whenever he could in a way that I believe overreached and was in uh, was often unconstitutional. In fact, he lost more cases than I know in the Supreme Court than anybody before him had ever right. done. That's something that you, President Trump, or you, President Clinton, have got to try to do immediately, repair relations with Congress and get the leadership in on foreign policy questions, um, particularly if you're going to do something like try to improve uh, the, the defense situation. Right. And if you are trying to do more anywhere, you're going to need support in Congress. So that's something you, you need to change the tone fairly fast. Because I think by the summer, by the summer of 2009, I think Republicans on the Hill and even Democrats on the Hill had already come to the conclusion they were going to have trouble with the new administration. So that's not something you can do in year two. That's something you do um, at the outset. And you deal with Congress a lot, testify informally, formally, privately, brief them. Uh, generally speaking, compared to you know the 30 years you've been, 35 years in Washington, decent congressmen and senators, decent leadership on foreign policy and defense. You feel like they're, you know, in terms of the functioning of American government, is this a, you know, a Congress a good president could work with? I, I mean, I, don't, I, I actually hadn't really thought about this question until I asked it to you, and I guess my instinct is it's not so bad, but I'm curious yeah, what you think. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's probably not as good as it was. I mean, in the <laughs> the golden days, the olden times, right. uh, you um, the leadership was stronger in those days, and you could do a deal. The armed services committees were great empires. Um, yeah, I think it was actually, I think the congressional leadership was in a certain way more, I don't want to say patriotic, that's the wrong word, more responsible mm -hmm. um, back in those days. Uh, and in a certain sense understood, okay, this is good for the country. My job is to deliver it for the president. That's, I think, basically gone, partly because everybody's an entrepreneur now. Parties are much weaker. You've got to get yourself reelected. Um, so you've got to look out for yourself a lot more. That said, um, if you go down the list of names, of course, it may change hands, but, <clears throat> um, you know, these are sober people. And I think a, um, a president can reach out and say, look, we, we have problems. We've got to deal with these problems, whether it's Trump or Clinton. I need your help. Um, that was not the Obama way. Right. Uh, Obama really, I think, broadcast a sense of Congress is an inferior branch, uh, and I'm really much smarter than you, and you need to get out of my way. And if you don't, I'll do what I want anyway. Uh, right from the start, um, you know, there are lots of stories from Democrats and Republicans about this. Um, you've got to get away from that. And uh, I think people will react. Um, of course, uh, it helps if, you <laughs> helps if you had a landslide. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons people did that with Reagan was that the country had just said, we want him. Yeah. If it's a and the Republicans won the Senate for the first time in 25 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll see what, I mean, uh, uh, it looks now, as we're talking, that the Republicans will keep probably keep both houses, which means that particularly for Clinton, it'll be important to reach out to these people, most of whom she knows because she was a senator. I mean, it's... What eight years ago? But um, Secretary of State. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she uh, she ought to be able to uh, to do this. Very important. It is important, actually. I think. Yeah. People don't quite appreciate maybe how important it is. And the uh, the other thing, of course, is that um, it's harder for them to ask all these senators and congressmen to be responsible and take tough votes. In my opinion, when both she and especially Trump have been so irresponsible in the campaign, though, you know, I. I can't get over quite the, uh, I think in the old days, I mean, this is maybe, again, nostalgia, and of course there was Joe <laughs> McCarthy and there were, yeah. you know, the uh, governed Democrats and all this, but, the, the, you know, if you had a pending trade agreement with major allies that the current president, Democrat, and the current Speaker of the House, Republican, and the majority leader of the Senate, Republican, are all for, so it's sort of bipartisan leadership agreement. 
you might have your quali- core, you know, I might have to rethink some parts of it. You would be making it a staple of your, as Trump does, of your attacks yeah. on the current administration, and then having the Secretary of State from that administration flip, flip her view and sort of go along with the attacks. I mean, and then also be kind of quiet while Trump attacks NAFTA. I mean, you worked all the years as Secretary of State for Latin America. It's, I mean, what, what do they think down there in Mexico? I mean, you know, you, you do sort of, and it's not like Hillary was really out there saying this was a very good thing. One of the things I'm right. proudest about from my husband's administration. <clears throat> and that, again, was a good case study where Gingrich shepherded it through the new Republican or provided cover, I guess, in the lame duck session for the for what was going to be a Republican House and so forth, Dole and the Senate. I mean, it really... I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think part of the explanation for it is <clears throat> putting aside the personal views of the two candidates. Something seems to have happened this year that, that was not predicted in, with respect to Trump and Sanders. You had it in both parties. No, that's true. Of, of Americans saying, I'm really sick and tired of this. I think it stinks. It's not working. It's not working for me. This whole system is fixed. Um, now, of course, some of that is because the two candidates were saying it, but, but Sanders got a much bigger reaction than Clinton expected, and Trump won yeah. the nomination. And so I think both of them are sort of, and many members of Congress, are looking around wondering how large and powerful is right. this beast? Right. And is it going to end up devouring me? So people are less responsible in that sense. I wanted to add one Which other thing. Which makes it harder <clears throat> for the new president. Uh, it does make it harder. Um, again, we'll see what the election results are. But I, I, the average American does not go around saying, you know, the problem is NAFTA. That's why I lost my job. The problem is this TPP thing. Leadership counts a lot. And what um, you may be suffering economically. You're not an economist. You are not sure who to blame. Um, people will tell you or make suggestions. So I think a new president has a real opportunity to kind of, if he or she wants to, lead away from that and back to a kind of more what sober and responsible view of the world, if that's the desire of the president. I think there's another thing the president has to do with I mean, to put it as a stop apologizing. Uh, I think you'd probably get that with either of them, but I'm really struck that, the, to me, the theme of um, eight years of Cuba policy and Iran policy has been to make up for past crimes by the United States. So when we negotiate with Iran, we, know we don't even negotiate with Cuba. I mean, we just hand them right. gifts to... Uh, try to compensate them for crimes committed by the United States in the past. Um, I think you kind of see this in Obama's last UN General Assembly speech, which uh, was September 2016, um, which is a wonderful speech in a way if you love President Obama. And it, it, it kind of summarizes his view of the world, which is one in which um, we need to move away from American power and leadership toward globalization of everything. Um, and you see that in the Iran policy and you see it in the, in the Cuba policy. We really have to reverse that. And again, speeches now, uh, speeches can do that. The tone one takes can fairly quickly suggest the president, the new president, doesn't believe that and uh, no more giveaways. Um, we're going to, and the way to do that in, the, in Cuba and Iran, obviously, um, be much tougher. I mean, be much tougher um, a lot of promises were made by the Obama administration with respect to the Iran deal that have not come true or seem actually to have been uh, untrue and devious when they were made. Um, well, do we pick up on that or do we make believe it didn't happen? Do we pick up on the fact that we were supposed to be helping in Cuba and the human rights situation is much worse now or do we not want to hear about that? Uh, Hillary Clinton didn't, you know, she endorsed the Cuba thing. It's not her deal. So even she, I think, is, is, is free to um, move away from that kind of uh, singular Obama view of America's place in the world. Yeah, what strikes me listening to this and thinking about what you're saying, though, is we have sort of a double challenge. Obama's eight years, people like us think at least, and I think objectively one has to say, is not produced a stronger America. It's produced a uh, America that's feared less, some of you respected less, a world that's in more chaos, maybe... Obama couldn't do anything about it or just life but whatever in the 21st century but it is I think objectively the case um, and then we have a campaign where this is I think an important point you made unlike with Reagan in 80 or 
um, where the Republican candidate has run on a war, war withdrawal from the world to some degree yeah. and war condemnation of bipartisan trade deals, of all the wars we fought, which were entered into on a bipartisan basis, I would add, Afghanistan and Iraq. And the Democratic candidate um, might agree privately with a fair amount of what you're saying, but was Obama's Secretary of State. So it's sort of a funny situation where there's, there's not a natural... Uh, it will take work to produce the policies and the support for the policies that you're calling. <clears throat> it's It'll not take, just a, a natural development. Uh, work and uh, people. You know, um, nothing that Hillary Clinton's going to hear if she is president-elect is going to come as a shock to her, I think. Uh, not just because she was Secretary of State, but, you know, she moves in these circles, and her staff consists largely of people who were with her at State, and um, it's different for Trump. His, the information flow is going to be very different. I know he's getting uh, briefings what, 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 twice a week or something, but that's nothing. That's, you know, what, 30 minutes, 60 minutes? Yeah. Um, now it is uh, constant, and you're surrounded by people who are telling you things, and they may be telling you things you don't want to hear. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, your defense secretary, your national security advisor, deputy national security advisor, be coming in all the time and telling you things. And they may contradict things you've said during the campaign, probably will. They may contradict things you believe. So, you, have, you know, you can fire them. Um, the president can give signals, I think. I uh, hope this isn't too disillusioning for people watching, but take the CIA. The CIA is pretty savvy about what the president wants to hear and not hear. And, uh, you know, they don't cut off the information flow, but you can emphasize things or de-emphasize them. And you can try to cater to the president's particular interest or views. And, and you don't want to fight with him every morning when you're briefing him. That will affect the information flow. Hmm. Uh, it takes a fairly brave uh, official permanent uh, uh, civil servant or appointee um, to say repeatedly, uh, you need to read this, knowing that the president is not going to like it and not want to want, going to want to hear it. Uh, your job is ultimately at risk, not that morning, but, you know, uh, particularly a new president like Trump is probably uh, going to be more willing than Clinton to um, get rid of people. So uh, I, I do worry about that, I must say, that, that here's somebody dealing with a completely new world, and there is the risk that the people he brings in with him um, will cater too much to what he wants to hear. Do you think in general that the institutions of government in foreign policymaking, national security, are functioning pretty well, I mean, or, or could be made to function pretty well. I mean, obviously, I think we all agree, we both agree that there should be increases in defense spending and defense capability, but as a basic matter, if with the right leadership and the right policies, does the U.S. government, in your view, work well, in foreign he, policy? Yes. People he, all say, oh, these, yeah. every, these, it's become sort of commonplace to say it's all broken, everything's broken, you can, can't accomplish anything. Uh, you were in government. And no, I don't believe it. I mean, here's an example of why I don't believe it. Unlike Europe, we have not suffered these ISIS terrorist attacks. There's, no been, there's not been a Bataclan here. Why is that? Because it works. I mean, there are many reasons, but it's partly because the CIA and the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are competent at doing this. Um, yes, they're going to keep on trying to hit us, and maybe sooner or later they will, but um, we've developed an ability to do this. These agencies function. And my experience, you know, when you change from Carter to Reagan, wow. That was really a significant change. And the bureaucracy, if you take the State Department, probably everybody voted for Carter or, I don't know, 80%. John Anderson, right? The rest yeah. Of the <laughs> so, uh, but I found that uh, people were pretty loyal if you treated them right, gave them leadership, told them, look, here's what the president wants to do. And by the way, here's the loyalty counts. I mean, Haig fought the president. I remember with George Schultz that um, uh, people would sometimes say, the president's wrong about this. We have to do this. We have to do that. And Schultz would listen, and he would say, um, you know, you may be right. All you need to do is get yourself elected president. Yeah. But Ronald Reagan got himself elected president. We're going to do it his way. You need, you need a cabinet office who can, who can make those bureaucracies function because the people in them are often um, quite 
competent. So I don't, I don't think the government's broken. I think that, that um, it will respond to strong leadership on the part of a president. I want to ask about the world and how broken the world is and whether it will <laughs> respond to our strong American leadership, which is sort of the flip side of the question. I'm reassured by what you say about the institutions, but I can't resist just as a parenthesis. So what was it like? I don't think we discussed this the other time we went a little more through your career. What was it like being an assistant secretary of state, working for a secretary of state, who was really <laughs> almost open war, right, with the White yeah. House? And surely you, of course, communicated with people in the White House. Well, you did routinely in your job anyway, right? You're yeah. assistant secretary of state for this. You meet with your counterpart at the National Security Council, and uh, you knew people anyway in the White House. How, what was that like? I mean, was it, how tricky was it, or was it, was it not? No, it's know? very tricky. It's very tough. It's very tough. I remember I was very young then. Yeah. I would go in and see Haig. You were the youngest assistant secretary of state, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I was 32 when I was appointed, and I would go in and talk to Haig. And, and so you were assistant secretary of state at that point for? International organizations, the first year, UN. Um, and, um, uh, he would, and we didn't know each other before. I, I met him when he offered me the job. Secretary so, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, Secretary Haig. And um, I'd go into his office, and he would do a tirade about the president and the White House staff. And, you know, I was pretty young, but I was smart enough to think to myself, what are you doing? You shouldn't be saying this to me. Right. You don't know me that well. I could be reporting back everything. What are you doing? So it was pretty clear that that was doomed. Um, and you're caught, and you because you're he's your boss, you're loyal to him. But on the other hand, you're a presidential appointee, formally speaking, really loyal to him. And there are moments when you, um, I had some of these moments. It's an you, important point, and people don't understand that at that level of assistant secretary and up, right? You are uh, appointed by the president, you're confirmed by the Senate, and of course, the secretary of state is your boss. Or if you're at right. the education department, the secretary right. of education is your boss. But you're not really, you're not a staffer for the secretary of state. You're a presidentially you, you, appointed. Formally you are, and the thing that's hanging on your wall yes. is signed by the President of the United States. Right. Um, so uh, you can get caught in the middle of this, and there, are, there were moments where I remember thinking, what do I do here? Who do I tell about this? Um, <clears throat> I, I, you, really get, you can really get crushed in the middle of that. Um, and this happened throughout the Reagan administration. You know, we remember it as perfect, yeah, right. uh, some of us, but um, on the foreign policy here, I mean, Schultz, I think, was a very great Secretary of State. But in the White House, there was a constant turnover of national security advisors and their staff. Uh, no one served for more than, a, I think, two a year and a half, two yeah. years, yeah. Um, so it wasn't perfect. And the relations with the State Department were constantly up and down. And that is, you know, that's going to be critical for whoever is president. And presumably Clinton knows this, but it's not at all clear that Trump Knows it. And the world, and we discussed briefly that in 1980, Reagan was able to turn it around pretty quickly by showing strength, I think. And first, the Iranians were preemptively worried enough about him to release the hostages. And, yeah. and then, of course, the, the, all kinds of other things happened. And, and a big defense build up. I think that set a signal. And, uh, and then the air traffic controllers. Um, how deep is the hole we're in? I mean, you know, when we talked earlier, in a way we made it seem that, well, if the <clears throat> president does the right things for the first month yeah. or two or three, Prime Minister <clears throat> Abe and all of our friends mm -hmm. are reassured, and Khamenei and all of our opponents, Putin, are kind of, ooh, it's a new U.S. I mean, how, how bad is the situation, though? I mean, how much? Uh, you know, I, I'm, <clears throat> I may be overly optimistic, but it seems to me that um, there are things we can do in a number of these places, and a lot of this is the... Um, impression of who's rising and who's falling. And I think that can be changed pretty quickly mm -hmm. so that people begin to wonder, oh, I wonder what's going to happen here because, you know, the Americans are really coming back. So it's direction as much as... Uh, I, I, I really think it is. Yeah. And uh, perhaps this is too optimistic, but it seems to me that you can begin to get people to recalculate. And again, they're also looking ahead one, two, three, four years. Um, <clears throat> we should add one thing here. Um, we are making believe that um, nothing unexpected is going to happen. So that was my final question. So let's <laughs> talk about that some. So let's, what advice, and the president will say, what else should I be thinking um, about? And I take it one thing you might say to him, we've had this conversation. Black swan. Bit. Yeah, or even, not even quite black swan, but just the routine unexpected things. Yeah. Foreign leaders die, if people lose elections. Yep. Uh, accident. Yep. You know. Well, one of the things that you should do, you as the president-elect, <clears throat> is to, well, you should do it in the transition. You should, you know, you, you should assign people to give you a list of things. You should have your national security advisor 
um, what do I need to focus on? What's coming in the first you know, three months, six months? Um, but then you need a separate conversation on, on precisely this. Um, of course, some things are totally unexpected, like an assassination, but um, who's old and sick? And does it matter uh, if so-and-so dies, if so-and-so dies? Um, what are the kinds of events? Well, okay, terrorist attack domestically. What would happen if there were an ISIS attack? It's plausible. It's happened in Europe. It can happen here. 9-11. 9-11. Um, uh, um, are you ready? And one of the things that makes this harder is, okay, we can make the list. Let's say um, ISIS. God forbid we have a kind of Bataclan attack. We have 150 people killed. Or 9-11, we have thousands killed. So you have, a you have a menu of options, and you need to consider them with your advisors. But these are new advisors. You know, uh, you, you might be lucky and nothing, nothing will happen for a year. But if it's February, so then you get advice from your new Secretary of Defense, and you're, I think you're sitting there thinking, I don't really know this guy that well. He's been in that building for a month. How good is his advice? Um, who are you? And, you know, you also, you new Secretary of State. I don't know. So it's a problem because there's no track record for you to rely on the people who surround you. Um, but, you, but you certainly need, I think, during the transition to have some sense of, um, yeah, they're unexpected events, but they're not. What if um, Putin sends Little Green Man to Estonia? I was just thinking about that example. Not an Which is, yeah, perfectly plausible. Test a new president. Um, take advantage of the disorganization and sort of wish to not begin your administration right. by getting in some tough confrontation with... Putin, of course, especially right. for Trump, who's though, likes Putin. <laughs> though, right. Though, I mean, though, I, my answer to that would be Mr. President, if you preside over the destruction, in essence, the destruction of NATO, that will be your historic contribution, and you'll never recover from it. Um, but, you, but, but there's an example. Putin, Green Man, Estonia. Um, China, Southeast China Sea, or where they start making a few moves about Taiwan, tightening the noose on Taiwan. They seem to be unhappy with the current president of Taiwan. Um, so there are, there are a bunch of these that are Iran. Um, I think they're not dumb enough to do this, but Iran in the Persian Gulf, um, capturing some more American sailors or something like that. Uh, major terrorist event overseas, uh, blowing up an American embassy, that sort of thing. There's a list of things. There are not 200 of these. You know, there, there are a dozen or so. And uh, somebody ought to be sitting around thinking through options so this is not a complete blank slate. In some of these, you don't need to respond instantly. Um, with, with Iran, you probably do. With the terrorist attack, I mean, look, 9-11 happened, and it was a while. I mean, it wasn't a year, but it was a while before Bush responded in Afghanistan, although he made the decision to respond in Afghanistan pretty quickly yeah. once we knew it was al-Qaeda. Um, make your decision and then, you know, give the military or CIA a few months. But you really need to be ready because if you're caught flat-footed, let's say in February, how does your administration recover from that? It might not. Yeah, I mean, I was in the White House when Saddam invaded Kuwait, and that was two and a half years into a Bush administration that was very, I guess one and a half years, I'm sorry, I can't get my math right. But it was a very experienced foreign policy administration. He'd been the vice president before, Jim Baker. I mean, you couldn't have had more experience, really, to go across. Cheney, um, yeah. the degree of surprise and shock. And he had been signaling trouble, right, Saddam? And, uh, but, and yeah, if you got that in the first month or two of your administration, I mean, that could really be something else. And there are a bunch of dictators. It's not, you know, there's not just Putin, right? There are other dictators. Um, other <clears throat> what do you do if uh, Hezbollah attacks Israel and there's a major war there? What do you do if an American plane gets shot down over Syria or Iraq? Um, Bush early on, I think it was March or something like that, had the Chinese shoot down an American, uh, American jet. Um, and again, it's a brand new team. Now, he had an experience. Yeah, that's team. where Trump is so different. I mean, Hillary Clinton is more like, uh, you know, Bush 41. Bush 41 taking over and whatever, good or bad, but nonetheless, experience. She'll have people with experience. She's been through crises many times. Yeah. Um, yeah, a new president with a new team, with no Washington experience, that really would be, it needn't be bad, it just would be no, different. Well, I, I, I think mean, it would be. It means, um, for Trump, it means the selection of personnel is doubly important, and it means the transition 
the post-election transition, uh, you've got 10 weeks, I guess. I think about. Um, critically important to raise the level, of, you're not campaigning anymore, uh, raise the level of foreign and defense knowledge. Uh, spend a lot of time with, um, well, may, I, I was going to say with the CIA director, of Secretary of Defense, he may not trust these people. Right. Okay, so find people you do trust. I mean, if it's Trump, I'd say you need to spend a little more time with um, George Shultz and Henry Kissinger. Um, I would hope he would spend some time with um, George W. Bush, um, who would be his Republican predecessor. Because right. um, it can be very useful. And, you know, he's, I, I don't want to be, you know, insulting him, but I mean, we're telling the truth here, which is that he is um, less prepared for this job on paper yeah. uh, than anyone has ever been. We've had people before who had not been in, in um, government office, but they tended to be generals. I mean, right. Eisenhower, Grant. And people who hadn't been in federal office, like right, a Reagan or Carter, but they've been governors. And people who hadn't been in executive office, Obama, uh, John Kennedy in a way, but, but they've been senators. So yes, some, one, some aspect or other, these people at least nominally were prepared for, I suppose. Obama, you could argue, with the least sort of... And know, that is not, And that is not a happy comparison. No. And Iran yeah. happened in what? The Green Revolution was uh, uh, five three, months four, after four, June two thousand nine. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. mishandled it badly. Yeah, whether that was yeah. his ideological predilection or just some degree of just being. But I do have the impression some of it was was kind of you know not wanting to deal with a crisis and therefore pretending it wasn't a crisis. And he had his own thoughts. He was going to be you know. Well, I think this is critical actually. Um, <clears throat> part of his ideology and preparation, but there's another part of it too. Um, Obama, I mean, this is I think fairly apparent from things that have been written about him, um, believes he can do everything better than anybody else. And he's, you know, these famous quotes, I'm, I, I'm a better right. campaign manager than my campaign manager, I'm a better speechwriter than my. And his view basically was, uh, I'm the smartest person in this room, doesn't matter what the room is, I am the smartest person here, why should I listen to you? If you were so smart, why come you're not the president? Right. This is very different from the view that the presidents I worked for, Reagan and George W. Bush had. Their view was, you know, I need to surround myself with basically the smartest people I can find, and I need to listen to them. They have important things to tell me. Um, and it was not false modesty here. It, it's really a way of looking at solving problems. Uh, uh, every president needs help. Uh, Bush was a very confident man, but he didn't think he knew everything in the world. Um, I hope that's true of Trump should he win the election, that he recognizes, um, y you know, uh, the dynamics between you and your advisors should be an open conversation, period. And I guess the challenge for Secretary Clinton is more, at least from your point of view as I take it, and I would agree with it, that to kind of think of it as a fresh start. She doesn't have to do things in 2017 because not doing them, or because doing them might call into question something she went along with in 2010 when she was Secretary of State. I think that's a bit of a risk for her and for anyone like that. You you, you want to defend your previous positions and not cast that on them, but it would be bad to hamstring yourself in that way, I think. Um, <clears throat> she would have a problem that the last, if you will, third term president, George H.W. Bush, didn't have. When Reagan left office, he was uh, very old, and his health was beginning to decline. And after he left office, you know, uh, it declined in the couple of years a lot, and he was not seen from. Remember, he did that farewell address to the American people. Yep. Boy, this is not going to be the situation well, that's a good, <laughs> for Hillary that's Clinton. That's a good final thing to think, talk about. She's got what a, about that, a that young uh, predecessor, if she comes in, who, um, who's not even leaving Washington, which is unheard of. Everybody leaves Washington. So he's going to be here. He's going to be around. He may try to discipline himself. I would certainly hope so to keep his mouth shut. Um, but you know, if you're in Washington, that means that when you go to dinner, um, and it's a completely off the record conversation, only 30 people hear it and, and repeat right. it to the press. Um, he would have to exercise uh, exceptional self-discipline. And if what's coming out of the Clinton White House, I mean, this happened with George H.W. Bush right. toward the Reagan White House. If what's coming out is, thank God they're gone. And, uh, you know, we're a lot smarter. We're going to do a lot better. And they made so many mistakes. My God, these people, jeez. Um, Obama's human, and he's going to react to that. Reagan didn't. He was gone. 
um, he's going to react to that, and his people are going to react to that, and they're not the same people. So I do think if um, I were Clinton, <laughs> there is a new problem that I think previous presidents haven't had. Your predecessor's young, healthy, vigorous, in Washington, likely to want to defend his record. And believe strongly in, I think, what he did and that this was very important for the country to get out of this old-fashioned, you know, interventionism and et cetera. And he's, I think he believes, even in Syria, which has been such a humanitarian and moral and political disaster, that it was better than the alternative. And uh, to the degree that someone like Clinton would come in and have to rethink, you would think, Syria policy, uh, he will take it as a bit of a... It would be a reversal. I mean, it would are, be a reversal, and, and it, people I would mean, see it, it as a reversal. <clears throat> it's not like it would be a big mystery, right? I mean, you know, it creates problems for the White House and for President Clinton. But there's a deeper, maybe it's a deeper question too, which is, were that to happen, it's a very interesting division in the Democratic Party. There's the Clinton wing, and what you might call, maybe this would turn out to be the Obama Sanders wing on foreign policy. How deep does that go? Uh, who's where on the Hill, uh, what are you hearing from the grassroots, and what does that mean? Um, I think there's some people who tell you should be a one-term president from the point of view of age. Maybe, maybe not, but um, you would begin to have a fight over the future of the Democratic Party. People talk about this fight more in terms of the Republican Party, yeah. which is fair enough, but, uh, but you'd see it, I think, and it might, it, we, we think about Sanders and Clinton, it might be Obama and Clinton. And with Trump, he would either stick to his campaign pledges or go back on some of them into a more, I suppose you'd say, traditional Republican foreign policy. And either way, there'll be people fighting on that, too. Uh, there know. will. And, and, you know, uh, again, Trump <clears throat> would enter at 70. Is he a two-term president? Yeah. Um, I think m many people would assume not. And if not, okay, again, you know, then we have a new generation. Uh, there's a lot of Republican senators. Some of them ran for uh, president. Others would step up. Um, who are in their 40s. Yeah. Um, that's, it's not a new generation. It's two generations down. Um, and what do they think about foreign policy? What are they, how do they position themselves vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, um, a Trump presidency? Of course, it depends partly on how successful he is and how popular he is. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the positioning for 2020 begins the day after the election. Right. So really, when you think about it, it's uh, you have a, a new president would face a very difficult world, a difficult task getting his or her organization, <laughs> his or her administration organized, um, difficulties within his or her political party, I think, and explaining to the country even what you're doing, because it's not as if the country will have been prepared by yep. this campaign. So pretty daunting. It is pretty daunting. Um, on the other hand, most people want this to work, and your citizens want this to work. And I remember George Bush saying this was during Iraq war, but um, you know, the difference between him and the Chinese leader, Hu Jintao, at that time was he said, I've got 300 million people praying for me. He doesn't have any. So uh, I think presidents can feel that kind of uh, support and, and, and reassurance. And the truth is that the day after the election, politicians may be trying to figure out 2020, but I think most Americans will say, okay, I voted for this person, I didn't vote for this person, but uh, let's pray it works. It's a good note to end on, and I hope the next president seeks your, seeks your advice and takes your advice. So. Well, after this, I don't know, but ah, we'll but see. Once this is on, <laughs> it's inevitable, easy. <laughs> Elliot Abrams, thanks very much for joining You're me welcome. today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.